Okay, welcome to Gearbox. Today we've got Jeff McKenzie with us from Jans. Jeff, welcome. Hi, thank you. Okay, so we've got new Shaw Axion system here, which is uh, some fancy new digital wireless kit. Mm -hmm. First um, time in the country. First time in the country. Now, before we get on to exactly what the Axion is, let's let's address the need for it and what, what the problems are that it's designed to, to resolve. What are some of the problems that we've encountered with traditional wireless microphone systems as we know them? Yeah, um, the biggest problem that we all face today is that uh, the growing number of wireless mic systems out there, I mean, you know, not that many years ago, 16 mics on a show was considered big. Now yep. that's uh, you know, a, an average church. That's amateur now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're up around 40 to 50 systems on, you know, largish size shows, sometimes more. Yep. But on top of that, the available frequencies are shrinking, you know, due to digital dividend sell-offs around the world and things like that. So the pool of available frequencies is getting less the demand is getting greater. So the net result there means that there's a lot more competition for frequencies from both uh, external influences like white space devices and television transmitters and even other wireless mic users, wireless intercoms, in-ear monitors, things like that. So on larger shows, uh, it's not uncommon now to have a dedicated person whose job is to coordinate and police frequencies, okay. uh, the RF cop. Um, and their duty is to walk around work out all the wireless devices in use, work out compatible frequencies, and work out that um, everyone's using those and that they don't just flick frequencies on the fly. Yep. You know, because it's one thing to just sort of say, oh, something's happened, let's just choose a new frequency. But if you choose a new frequency at random, there's no guarantee, in fact, the odds are against you that you'll choose a compatible frequency. You're likely to land on another device or land on something that creates an intermod that lands on another device. So all these changes need to be pre-calculated engineered up front, ready to go. And I guess the other problem that you've got, that, that no matter how good the RF tech mm -hmm. is, they, they can't predict when, say, you know, a little ENG crew is going to come in and flip on some of their own wireless gear as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've been there, right? I can speak from experience. Um, so the, the trick there is that if you're trying to get, uh, say, 40 wireless mics working, you pre-calculate 60 frequencies. Of course. In anticipation of that happening. So you've got a bunch of spares, either for somewhere to go or somewhere for new people that turned up unannounced to use. Yep. And again, that's part of the manager's job. Sure. Now, that all works fine if you're doing a show and, you know, it's a one-off type show and you've got a dedicated person as this frequency manager. Where that becomes uh, an issue, though, is if you've got something where you don't have that person available or if it's a long-running production, so a musical theatre production that's going to go out on the road and run for six months. That gets very expensive. Yeah. Yep. So, so the quest has been, the desire has been to build that level of intelligence and that level of self-management into the hardware. So effectively, plug and play. Plug the thing up, tell the receivers to self-manage and give them the ability to do that. Okay. Tell us about how Axiant does this. Okay, well, the, really the, the core ingredient that allows this to happen is one very, very significant change to the way wireless mics have worked. Is a traditional wireless mic in the past has been a transmitter that transmits to a receiver. And whilst we think of them as a system, they're not really a system. It's a transmitter that is on the same frequency as the receiver, but there's no hard coordination between the two. So if you want to change the frequency on the transmitter or change an audio level or anything like that, you have to go out and get the transmitter, right? So that involves either stopping the performance or sneaking out and uh, trying to get the mic back, make some changes, or if it's a musical production and using body packs buried under um, you know, under set pieces or clothing, then you've got even bigger problems, right? Because you can't get to them at all. It gets awkward. It gets very awkward. So the, d the trick has been to get the ability to remotely control the amplifier, the yep. amplifier, the microphone. The preamp. The preamp. The whole thing. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> and this is what this device here that's sitting between the two of us is doing. This is a 2.4 gigahertz data link back to the transmitter. So all of the Axiant transmitters whilst they're an analog FM transmitter, uh, same way we've been doing it for a while to keep latency low, yep. they're digitally controlled via the network. So one show link transmitter like this can control 15 microphones out in the wild. And that gives us the ability to do uh, even just little things like adjust the gain up and down from the receiver or from the laptop live while the mic's in use. Which if you've ever done a hip hop show is a very valuable thing. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of times you want to just, let's just drop the level, you know. Mm. It might have been fine at sound check, but as the night goes on, everything seems to get Everyone a Everyone gets excited. Um, now, once we've got that level of control, we can also do things like change frequency. Cool. So that gives us the ability to get the mics to move on demand. Okay. So first part solved. 
The second part becomes, okay, where do we go to? Because as I said before, it has to be a managed, pre-calculated jump. We can't just blindly jump. And that's where this device down here, the frequency manager, comes into play. Okay. It is a one RU device. It looks very much like one of the receivers. Not surprising there. It's actually got eight receivers on board. And what it's doing is it's scanning the frequencies that are in use. So if you've got, say, 12 or 16 mics on air, it's scanning those frequencies and making judgments about the quality of that. But it's also holding in reserve a large number of backup frequencies. So you've got your somewhere to jump to yeah, already planned. Yeah, and it's constantly scanning the backup frequencies as well and rating them. So it looks at the signal to noise ratio of your backup frequencies and rates them as the best through to the worst choice. So that when it detects interference on one of the frequencies that are in use, it knows where to go to and it knows the best frequency to go to. And via the show link transmitter, it coordinates the jump. So the receiver and the transmitter jump at the same time. Net result is we do a frequency change in about 100 milliseconds, barely audible. It's pretty fast. Okay, so Jeff, let's let's talk about our demonstration here. We've got your microphone tuned to 580.550 meg, correct? Which is the one, I'll take your word for it, yes. And yep. this is the one I'm talking through now. And that happens to also be the same frequency this belt pack is tuned to. So I'm going to which turn is this currently on. Off, which and is I'll, currently off. And I'll you're talk going to keep through talking. this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's done it. So you may have noticed the screen flash red momentarily. That was the receiver detecting interference, which in this case was that transmitter, which is still going at the moment. And then it coordinated a hop in frequency. And that's uh, all been managed, obviously, by the by Spectrum the manager, manager device. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, that's using just a single channel. Uh, the next step up, if you, know, you may have heard a short momentary break in audio as it jumped, you may not have. It just depends on whether I was taking a breath or not at the time. Okay, so Jeff, we've got you now on your shiny new frequency. If we did get the gap in audio, and that's going to be a problem, not for most applications it would, um, mm -hmm. but if that's a problem, is there a way around that? I'm glad you asked. Of course there is. Um, the demonstration we just did a second ago was using one channel of the receiver, one mic to one channel of a dual receiver. Okay. The next step up is we can put the system into frequency diversity mode. Now, each of the handheld transmitters actually contains two UHF transmitters that's capable of transmitting simultaneously on two different frequencies. When we go into frequency diversity mode, we use both channels of the receiver simultaneously transmit on two different frequencies, and each frequency is managed independently. So if you get an interference hop, interference hit on one channel, it hops, but it takes audio from the you other channel. You maintain your audio from the other channel. During the hop period. Beautiful. So no breaks. The only way you could get a break in audio was if you had a hit on both channels at the exact same time, which is and the odds of that unlikely. are fairly low yeah. at this point in time in yeah. the universe. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, now we've got some other accessories here. We've got um, obviously a battery charger. The system runs on rechargeables. Yeah, the system runs on uh, lithium-ion rechargeables. Yep. Um, as you could imagine, with two transmitters on board, it falls a, a fair bit of juice compared to traditional mics. Mm -hmm. So lithium-ion is the preferred mode to power it. Uh, we can still get about six to eight hours battery life from the lithium-ions, mm -hmm. but if we were running on alkaline double A's, we'd, I don't know what we'd be getting, but it'd be substantially less. less. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also, and it's a lot greener too, right? You know? And they're brainy batteries too, right? Yeah. Um, each battery, if I can blindly fumble around here and eject one from the slot. Uh, each battery has a little memory chip on board. And uh, when you insert it into the charger, it updates the memory chip to tell it how many times it's been charged and discharged. Uh, one of the problems that we have to deal with with lithium ion cells is that the more times you use them, the less their overall capacity is. It reduces over time, yeah, over a long period, yeah. but it does happen. So if you're a large production company and you've got a bunch of these batteries rolling around in a drawer, you've really got no easy way of knowing what are the good batteries and what are the old batteries. So as you insert them into the charger, it interrogates that chip and it gives you a percentage readout for each battery on its anticipated life. So if you're loading them up and you've got a bunch of batteries that are at 90% and a few that are at 60, well, the 60% ones become your backup batteries and the 90% become your main batteries. Cool. Also gives you the ability to rotate them a little and share the mm. wear, share the load. Yeah, maintain it consistent. And obviously you, you get that readout via the charger on the laptop. Yeah, the, the charger has got an Ethernet port on the back of it, In as fact, does the it's antenna all got divider. Ethernet ports. Everything has an IP address these days. So you can do that remotely. You could be 
in the lounge at a LAX and interrogate your battery charger if you so desired. Great. Because um, <laughs> you've always needed to do that, right? Well, well it, it's nice to know that you can now. Um, uh, the joys of Ethernet. And you've got dual Ethernet ports, so you can actually just cascade your Ethernet. Yeah, each receiver, well, in fact, device. each device has a little two-port switch in the back. So you can just cascade your ports down if you wish, or you can take them all out to a, a switch and one port per device. Okay. And your you've call. Got same arrangement with power and uh, uh, up to 10 antenna connections as well. There's also a digital out on the back of each receiver now, an AES with word clock out. So um, each receiver can output analog audio in balanced, analog audio in unbalanced, and digital audio. Okay. Now, talking of outputs, you've got also now a switch option as well, a, a push to talk switch option for the handhelds. Yeah, that's kind of Talks a funky thing. That. I don't have one to show you, unfortunately, because it's not actually been released yet. But, well, this uh, is the first one the in the concept, country. The concept is that uh, I won't unscrew this because we're using it, but you unscrew the head and you fit the little switch device in between the mic capsule and the transmitter. Yep. And it gives you a momentary button on the transmitter. Now, by default, that's just a mute button. Yep. But in programming, you can tell it to do a couple of different things. And one of the uh, cooler ones is that you can toggle between the XLR output and the jack output. So, for example, if I wanted to send the jack output to a comm system in a broadcast environment and the XLR output to my live feed, I've now got a talkback mic. So I can be holding this, push the button down, and I'm talking on the comm system, release the button, and I'm live to air. Brilliant. So it gives you the ability to use the mic in you know, some real cool new ways that we couldn't do before. Sneaky talk. Sneaky talk. Brilliant. In monitor apps, you might be, that's the abuse the monitor guy button. Maybe. Well, that's, that's, um, that's a good point. You could... You could definitely use it in that situation for live. Well, that's great. Um, is there anything else we need to know? There's bound to be lots, but none that I can think of at the top of my head at the moment. Okay, if we want to find <laughs> out more, um, what's the website? Uh, www.axient.net, which is A-X-I-E-N-T. Okay. .net. Um, there's a whole bunch of videos there that explain the way the product works and data sheets. Excellent. Thanks very much for your time, Jeff. Thank you, Jimmy. Cheers. Pleasure.